to the found cause, where we have found our cause in the of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Michael, the man behind the machine, and right across from me today is Sebastian, the bookkeeper. We are hunkered down in a very fancy office, so hopefully we seem more regal and official. Sebastian, first of all, I want to invite the rest of our audience to like us on Facebook. We've got a new page out there. Last episode, I was talking about Spotify, but it turns out that will cost us money, so we're not going to do that yet. Uh, but you can find us on YouTube. I encourage you to subscribe to our page at foundcause on YouTube.com. You can look for our channel, see our, all our episodes there. You can also go to podbean.com forward slash foundcause and check out our first five episodes there, and you can download them at your leisure one day. We might actually buy the subscription to Podbean, and then we can post more than that and put it to Spotify and iTunes or whatever the kids are listening to these days. But for now, Facebook page, and that's it. Exciting future. All right. With that spiel out of the way, let me give you a scenario. Okay, It's 9 p.m. The sky outside is dark. It's stormy. It's daylight savings time, which makes everything disgustingly darker than it should be. You are cold, shivering, saving money by turning your apartment down to a 65 degree heat limit. You are staring at your computer screen, watching far too much YouTube, eating a bowl of Captain Crunch, and suddenly it hits you. What am I doing with my life? I'm 22. I've graduated from college. I've graduated from high school. I've graduated from middle school. It's all been done. All of it's behind me. I'm working a job. I'm sitting here eating Captain Crunch at 9 p.m. at night. What am I doing with my life? Is this even what an adult is? Am I a man working after God like the great men of God have done before me? What am I doing with my life? Sebastian, has that ever hit you? Oh, man, it certainly has. Even during college, right before finishing, you know, what am I going to do afterwards? Like, what, what is my life going to look like? It's one thing, you know, to when you grow up, you do have other people handling different responsibilities on your behalf with your, when you live with your family or any, or any close friends such as that. What am I going to do from now on? Well, I've had that question come to my mind before because you read scripture, all these great stories, people like King David, people like Moses, like the prophet Samuel, like Ezekiel, they had wonderful, meaningful lives. Did they screw up a lot? They definitely screwed up a lot. Wonderful is like, you know, being hunted to death, I guess, you know. That's exciting. Not, not, uh, Joel Olstein style, wonderful, huh? No, but it's ex definitely it's exciting. Like, wouldn't you agree? It's definitely more exciting than just sitting in your room. Eating watch, some Captain Crunch? Eating some Captain Crunch and watching some debates on YouTube, you know. It can be hard because you then start doubting yourself as a believer. Like saying, God, is this, is this it, God? Is this all of my life? What about all these people that did great things? Yeah, I understand I'm not going to be, they were not perfect. I'm not going to be perfect either. But they did all these things, like leading the Jews out of Egypt. That's a pretty big accomplishment, I would say. And it can be burdensome on a person if you, if you no, know, if you're not really, if you're doubting or if you're not too confident. Can, no, I haven't led you... the Jews out of Egypt yet. What am I doing? Exactly. So it can be, you know, the, the people, by person by person, it can be, can be burdening. So this is something that we're going to talk about because while... We do not know the future. You don't know. Maybe the Lord might just end up sending you to Armenia and convert the entire country. <laughs> That's your, your hidden dreams. You know, you speak them out loud, Sebastian, and God just plows them right into your trash can. I think that's how it works. <laughs> because, because, of, of, because of that, because even if we feel down, even if we feel not as quote-unquote great as those ancients in Scripture, we can still have, we can still be just as significant in the growth of the kingdom as those people. It might not be as glorious or as, you know, as exciting as being hunted down to death, sure, but it can still be meaningful for sure. Well, and who's to say you're not going to get hunted down? I think this, and this, so this is the <laughs> title and this is the, the podcast topic. What should young Christian people, boy or girl, of course, means Sebastian or men, so it's going to be coming from a men's opinion, but, but women or child or well, I guess not children. Anybody above 20-ish, just graduated-ish, um, early 20s, early 30s, and you are a Christian, you're looking for a purpose. The thing that comes to my mind, I've had the same, I've, when I'm sitting at 9 p.m. watching YouTube, eating Captain Crunch, that's me, except instead of Captain Crunch, it's a 60-piece um, thing of Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. It was half off because it was just after <laughs> Halloween and I'm eating way too many. That's the thing that strikes me. And, and the thing I think about first is the parable about the talents, right? Because that's mm -hmm. what God, what is God's given you. What do you do with it? 
when Jesus gives each one of the people talents, he gives 10 to the person who's super capable, right? And they prove themselves capable. They make 10 more. He gives five to the person who's mediumly capable and he does well. So he gets 10 more. Like he, he proves his, his service with little, all right? Medium amount, I guess five and received more. So he, it wasn't bad that he received a little in the beginning, right? He wasn't a Moses to begin with. He wasn't a super rich billionaire to begin with. He just had five talents instead of 10. And he did what he was faithful with a little. So he gave a lot. That's a biblical principle straight from the words of Jesus. Now, what we don't want to be, and I think this, this is where the, the running thoughts are appropriate and healthy. So you don't want to be the man who's given one talent and then, you know, hides it and really doesn't want to work for the Lord. So he wants to just keep what the Lord had and do the bare minimum. But you start thinking about, oh, no, am I only doing the bare minimum? What should I do? First of all, I think it's healthy to be questioning that so that you aren't the man with one talent. But I also think that as young Christians, we should be thinking about how do I invest my talents? Not just can I spin a porcelain plate on a stick, you know, in front of uh, a small middle school crowd. But what does God actually equip me for? Right? Right. Do you ever do a talent right. show? Yes. I'm, not, I'm trying to visualize you spinning, spinning a porcelain <laughs> I plate. I can't do that. It's not my talent be fascinating to see but yeah that's what i that's what i was trying to get at as well that god we established before on a reform theology podcast god has written history from beginning to end he has a purpose a plan for human history even more so for his people his sheep mm -hmm. he's not just gonna okay now you're safe bye bye now you get to like just sit in the couch and do nothing like and you're and crunch yeah while that may be a temporary situation in which actually might be a good thing because you're using that time to reevaluate your thing. So that's constructive. I would say if you're thinking, what should I be doing? You're probably heading in the right direction. Yeah, compared although to what you don't see is for four hours, you know, it's 9 p.m. right now. For the last four hours, I was st sitting there not contemplating oh, anything. So, you okay. know, uh, there's a little bit of a okay. sitting around. Okay, God is a patient man. God is a patient. <laughs> so we'll say, we'll, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. But, but I do want to emphasize that, yes, we all have talents. God has purpose for his sheep. Now, he does want the kingdom to be edified on this earth. You know, it's just, it's part of, um, part of our, of our duty as disciples of Christ. So, we all have talents in different in different fields. Some have more compassion than others. Some have more like physical physical skills, sure, but nonetheless, they're very important. They're very important for for the community, for your immediate life, for your family, for your friends. It can be edifying. So that is what we're going to try to drill down on. How can you use what God has given you mm -hmm. to edify His kingdom? Now, this isn't a uh, talent exploration, right? I'm not going to go through, me and Sebastian aren't going to go through all the different categories of talents because really nobody knows. Uh, but we do think that there are certain categories of things that anyone, regardless of who you are, can do and should do as a way of responsibly using the gift of life that you have, right? Everybody's mm -hmm. been given a gift of life. Not only that, you've also been, been given a gift of the Holy Spirit. So we know that anybody who's a Christian listening to this has those two things, life and the Holy Spirit. Um, so here's here's the categories of things that I think that I'm going to be preaching to myself and Sebastian probably will be as well. Um, not that we do all these things perfectly, but these are the things that have really helped us pursue adulthood, responsible adulthood, and not just generic adulthood, but Christian living, godly living, a way that is pleasing to God and shaping us to be more like him. The three categories of life decisions here are one, routine decisions, self-explanatory, two, Pinion decisions. I need a, a better name for that one. But pinion, a pinion is the, the pin that goes into a joint on like a robot arm that makes it uh, flex up and down. It's the, little, mm -hmm. you know, the elbow of the robot arm, imagine, right? That pin is the pinion. And these are pinion decisions that things hinge on. Uh, there's probably something with the word hinge in there, but hinge making decisions, things that split your path. And then lastly, the third category is attitudinal decisions and how we should have our attitude in our young adult lives. So first things first, I want to dive into the routine category. Uh, Sebastian, what are some routines that have been particularly either that you want to pick up or are godly? Uh, where, where do we even get First of all, where do we even get the idea for these categories? How do we get any wisdom on anything? Right. For wisdom, the only the only source in which we have of what is good, what is God's character is scripture, right? Mm -hmm. therefore while scripture has many purposes one of them is to be a guide to 
life and then it has information that God has deemed worthy for us to be sufficient of how to live our lives according to his purposes. Wouldn't you agree? Uh huh. Yes, absolutely. So with that in mind, there is several there are several instructions in scripture in how we can we can uh, live ac- according to in in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. For well, example, I, well, first things first, just to cut you short there, a routine, and I think you're going to see this, a routine that every single Christian should get into. And I don't just say this flippantly and because my pastor told me so, but this is something that has changed my Christian walk. And I was a Christian before I did this. And after I did this, um, just changed it up a lot. Read the Bible every day. And I don't mean that as in get an app on your phone that sends you one verse. Um, but while that's fine, that's not mm-hmm. really reading your Bible. I would highly encourage, because we just said it's the source of all wisdom. And you might think, oh, that's just a saying, right? When I read a genealogy in Leviticus, it's not really filling me with wisdom. I guarantee you, if you memorize scripture, um, that is, you'll see the depth of the scripture. You'll memorize, you know, a short, short verse, and it won't mean much to you on the surface. But the more you recite it, the more the spirit, the living word reveals itself to you. And it means much more and applies to much more than you ever thought it would. Read your Bible every day, a chapter a day minimum, I would say, because it is the, not only is it turning your heart towards God, right? It's a discipline. You have to wake up either early or do it late at night. You have to make sure you do it regularly. It's time for you to sit there with God. Not only is it all those things, but also the actual scripture reading has tons of value. Mm-hmm. More than you'd think on the surface. Right. We could expand, you know, on... I wanted to mention how just as you eat for... Feed your body, mm-hmm. scripture is food for your soul. We could expand on what composes the soul, but for now, for the time, for sake of brevity... We're going to say it is food for the soul. You don't just stop drinking water. You don't just stop eating. You're going to go hungry. Same with your soul. Scripture is food, is sustainability for your for your soul. That in mind, I do have scripture that I just posted on the Facebook that all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for instruction. Mm-hmm. That's straight from, the, straight from the Bible. Yep, from Timothy. Second Timothy, that's correct. So, scripture is God-breathed. Read it. As often as you can, or if you find it tedious to read, understandable. That's I would I would find myself in that case. When I go to the gym, when I go for a walk, when I'm going anywhere, when I'm driving, I just plug in my headphones and I listen to scripture. Oh, bless it be right. I I don't do that very often, um, but that is fan. I'm an audio learner kind of guy, anyways, and mm-hmm. that is a fantastic innovation because these things are read aloud to churches before everybody had a Bible right. in their hands. So it's not like it's blasphemy not to be reading the scripture on page, but if you're reading a faithful rendition of it or listening to a faithful rendition of it, it is filling yourself with the word. Mm-hmm. Well, Bible, you know, back in, I can get all excited about the history of it, but Bibles were extremely expensive back in the, in the ancient world mm-hmm. when they were first, like one gospel could cost you up to like modern about $10,000, just one God, not even the whole Bible, just one gospel mm-hmm. because parchment and papyrus was very expensive. I described too. So most churches only had the, the priest, the pastor would have the scripture and then the congregation would listen to scripture, as you said. So it is profitable indeed to just listen to scripture whenever you're whenever you have time that's one habit another habit that i would say that has changed for the better in my case is thanking the lord after every meal while that may be common for many people born and raised in the u.s as a peruvian i have to say that that is not a very common practice in south america so that's something that you know that i even though when i when I repented and put my trust in Christ, it's something that took a while, you know, a habit to develop because it's just something that I wasn't used to. But I think now that being thankful, appreciating what the Lord has given you is not only is it a good thing, but it's also good for your for your soul because rather than seeing the negative, you can appreciate all the things that you have in life that the Lord is permitting you to have, such as the food that's sitting right there in front of you every day. Yeah, and that's... This is kind of a strange practice of mine, but it's not communion when you eat by yourself because you're not with the body and everything like that. But I take the time to remember that God commissioned communion, right? Jesus gave the bread and water and bread and wine as a symbol um, of his body and blood for a reason. Because I think there's something involved in in consuming and eating because food is good. Drink is good. Mm -hmm. That that would be reminding you of the Lord. I totally agree. Grace is a huge saying grace before a meal saying thanks for a meal is a huge 
um, gratefulness increaser and is leaves you much more satisfied with not only the food you're eating but just with the evening in general yeah. yes it's you know our lives can get a can get the best of us you can have ba- you can have a bad day at work you can have people yell at you you know whatever or at the, on the road almost get almost get hit whatever you know bad day but just taking that moment to concentrate for a couple of seconds thanking the lord can make a huge difference not only in your mood but also also in your attitude in the long in the long run so definitely a must just after reading scripture daily now now people might at home might be thinking well if you're staring at your youtube eating captain crunch thinking of existential questions grace and reading your bible don't seem like shoe in easy solutions right that doesn't seem like some blasting life-changing experience and it's not that's why it's in this routine category but it is it's way more valuable than it looks like and that it is the building block style routine of putting your trust in the lord and faithful everyday things you did say you know like the the pinion on the hinge Mm -hmm. i see it more these things reading scripture daily and also being thankful to the lord as tiny gears that move giant ones down the down the Ah, line so these are like if you're on a robot arm (laughs) these are like the biceps huh the little little tiny gears that make up the bicep yes yeah. All right, well, let me talk about some more. We'll rapid fire it because I know we have a lot to get to. We've talked about it. So read your Bible, say grace, join a church. Mm. This You might think this is opinion, but it, it is routine. It doesn't seem particularly exciting on the surface. Join a church. This is a command from the Bible. In Second Peter, uh, Peter com- t- tells the, the congregation, do not stop meeting together. Some have us have made the habit of doing, of, of stopping meeting. You must. And this is something that convicted me in college. I I was going to church, but I wasn't really sure if it was just because that's what people did. And, you know, that not every church is like the most <laughs> exciting or even believer filled, which I would encourage you to find a one with real believers in it. But even even if the church is not very exciting, right, and maybe it is generally not very exciting or not very spiritually growth worthy. Again, I would encourage you to find one that is. But even if it isn't being in the presence of other believers and dutifully going to church as a gathering is a sign to the Lord that you are sacrificing and following him and that you desire him in enough that you would give up your Sunday morning or whatever it is to go and be filled. So join a church. Mm-hmm. That's that's a, a must for any Christian. It's not a maybe, it's not a recommendation, that's a must. Yeah. And there is blessing there's a blessing in being in church. Just taking the time out of your life, however tense, however dramatic your life might be, or boring. Just forgetting all of that, going to the church Jesus said, you know, when there's two believers present, I will be amongst them. Mm-hmm. You you do feel the peace of the Spirit, of worshiping together, of being communion together. So it is definitely healthy for you, but it's also, yes, a biblical command. So you definitely benefit from from doing that. Yeah, and do it. If you, if you claim Christ as Lord, follow his ways. Uh, going along with joining a church, serve the body. And this oh, is yeah. kind of to, to specify... Don't just go to a church, right? A different one every Sunday just because. Serve the body. So to do that, you have to actually get engaged with the people at the church, get to know your fellow Christians and serve. Mm-hmm. That could be parking attendant style, holding the door. That's a service method. It's, it's not very deep, right? And if that's if that's your thing, if that's all you do and that's, if that's your skill set, more power to you. But serving the body in routine means doing something that needs to be done in the church. So if there's a service that needs to be done, for example... My church need needed people to attend the kids ministry, which we can talk all day about maybe organizing your church differently and not having a, a kids ministry during service. That's all well and good. They needed people to serve because that's the way it was set up now. I'm not a super kids teacher guy, but well, I volunteered because I'm like, hey, this is a great, I've, I've got time. I'm eating Captain Crunch, uh, you know, staring at my YouTube for the most <laughs> point. I, I can serve the church in a way that they need it, right? And it's not a, it's not a menial task to be teaching the kids they needed people to rank the kids. So. Yeah. You serve the body and you yourself you've served i do michael yes and also i do want to mention that you can evaluate what your talents are that you of are course. confident yeah. of so for example if you're not a good speaker or you're ashamed of or ashamed you know you're shy of being in front of crowds teaching a class might not be for now maybe the of lord course. will develop this you. is probably a, a whole podcast in and of itself finding your christian talent yes. right but you know like use your discernment i would say and leave it at that use your judgment and pray about it exactly yeah yeah so i have musical experience i have 
play violin and I've also took singing classes at the Yovam. So what a great, and then there were the leaders in my church. They asked me if I wanted to join the bell, the bell group, uh -huh. having previous musical experience. So I participated in that and also the choir. So uh, it is very satisfying to praise the Lord through music as hard as it can be sometimes for the bells. You 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 talk a lot about those bells, man. Yes, it the is. way Sebastian describes these bells is like this is hell bell week. They are just putting them through the blitzkrieg. The bell boot camp. Yes, so I have to, I pick up really fast, but yes, so you see, I have musical experience. We do have well music. We could go in Puritan. We can go like Byzantine style with zero music, zero instruments. We, we could do that, but yes, you know the church is set up in which there is music. There is praising of the Lord. So I volunteer in that because mm -hmm. I feel if that I could contribute. That's the key. You can contribute to that. The other thing is I enjoy teaching. I enjoy reading. I enjoy presenting to other people. So I also volunteered for the high school class, the Bible, the Bible class in my church. So that is, you see, I'm using what I, what I, what I, well, yes, what I've been called for, what my leadership has asked me to do. And I'm using it try with my best intention to edify the church. And to somebody like me, my first impression when I hear these things is, oh, well, that's not very Herculean, isn't, you know, serving kids at your church or doing the bell, bell choir or teaching some some high schoolers. Like, it doesn't seem like you're part of the Red Sea or anything like that. And I was made for so much more. It's been 22 years for crying out loud. Like, I've had a lot of life building up. This doesn't seem like a pinnacle at all. I don't think that it is. So don't think that we're thinking this is you peaking, mm -hmm. but it is a dutiful way to serve um, the way the Lord has called you to. So that's exactly what it is. It's a routine thing, but it's one that is in the service of the Lord. This is foundational because if you can get into the habit of these things, then the Lord, if he wills it, he will give you more responsibilities. Yes, and just like the talents, right? Exactly. But you have to do the basics. You know, you have to get you have to get it down. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like you're not responsible. Like you need to get your house in order first before. Any yeah. more tasks are assigned. Exactly. Your Get your house in order, right? If you if you haven't cleaned the countertops, how are you ever going to fix the sink, right? I mean, you, you have to be faithful with a small thing. Exactly. Uh, last thing I want to say in the routine section, and this is super important, all these things are, regular prayer. Go along with Bible reading, and again, you hear it all the time in church, but if you don't regularly pray to God, and by regular I mean every day, then you aren't going to get anything. Like, how would you ever know if God was calling you to something if you aren't praying about it, right? He might, but you'd have to be an extra special person. And you know, <laughs> while we're all called by the Lord, uh, some we're not all extra special, right? We're not all Solomon, David, Elijah. Um, so if he's going to drop a school bus on your house to, to let you know that you have to do something, that's a rarity, right? Otherwise, stay in constant communication. Not only is it beneficial for you, mm -hmm. but it's the way you would even know that you have to do anything big, right? That you'd have to part the Red Sea. Jesus went and prayed every day. He went out on his own and he had things to do. He was the Messiah for crying out loud. He went out and prayed alone. That should be a sign to all of us that it is an absolute necessity. I also thought about how to pray. You could even do an analysis of exact of all the words that he used, but thanking the Lord is one of them, mm -hmm. and also like remembering your will be done. Like don't just don't, like God is not how to please out humans. We are His instruments for His will, so that's very important to pray for. Like how can I serve you, Lord? How can I grow so that I may be of better use for you? Would be some. I mean, that would be my my style. You can have your own style, and um. Also, prayer keeps us in tune with the the Lord. As a famous pastor that we both like to listen to, James White, said, the purpose of prayer is not for God to change events in history, but actually helps us be in tune with that particular thing that we're praying about. So it's in a way it's helping us grow as well. Mm -hmm. So definitely get on that habit. Easiest way to do it, when you wake up. Yep, I First agree. First thing you do. First thing you do. Or when you go to sleep, or both, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna stay on top throughout the day, yes. If you have a difficulty, pray about it. Yeah, when Paul writes to the churches, he says uh, Philippians, I think one of them. And here's my great on the air Bible quoting, but he says that he's continuously praying for the church, continuously. Mm -hmm. And how does he do that? I mean, he has to eat, right? He can't be like actually continuously because he has to eat. I, I'm sure it means that throughout the day he's praying, which. If you aren't used to praying at all, of course, that sounds daunting and weird. And like, you don't want to change your lifestyle doing that. Fine. But start at in the morning, start at night, right before you go to bed, right when you wake up, 
I, for one, started with just a nighttime prayer um, in my youth, in my middle school days, and that grew and grew, and now I do it in the morning, I do it in the evening, and it's, I, I don't want to sleep without praying. It's not like, a, oh, I'm racking up my consecutive streaks of praying days. It's because I need the Lord. I need to talk to God. He's like, it's like not saying goodnight to your kids or something like that. It's, it's that ingrained. Mm-hmm. We're not Muslims, you know. We're not not pray five times. It's, you know, I don't think you need a crazy routine like that if you want to take it up. You know, be my guest. But mm-hmm. uh, God creates in you desires that you wouldn't otherwise have, right? That's the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. So you should start by wanting to pray, to be in communication with the Lord. A great one that I just remember and I thought of would be praying before you read Scripture. Mm. That would be a pretty good one. Like pretty mm-hmm. easy. You know, you have the Bible in front of you or your phone whenever you're about to listen to it. Pray that. God speaks to you in a mean, in a, in a meaningful fashion, fashion that you can grow. Yep. As in, and be sanctified. Easy. You know, I I know we've been in this routine section for a lot, but I just want to tag one more in. I I said that was going to be the last. One more in self-control. I think this is is can have big impacts in your life if you don't follow it or if you do follow it, but I think it's a routine thing that happens every day. Practice self-control. Self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit, Mm -hmm. so certainly pray about it, and God is the one that provides it. But if you are addicted to eating, stop it. Food is just food. If you're shoveling down too much, I preaching to myself here because I hear I was shoveling down way too many Reese's peanut butter cups. I'm not a big guy, but I could be, but I ate all those Reese's peanut butter cups. Stop doing it. Same thing with porn. Don't watch porn, right? That's something that's... you Practice self-control. Not only is it a sin, it's also just... (laughs) I guess, how would it not be a sin? But mm-hmm. if it wasn't in the category of sin, it's also just not good for you. Just like eating. Eating isn't a sin, but too much of it is not good for you. Any porn at all is too much. So stop it. And the same thing goes for anything that's in excess, right? If you're overspending, don't overspend. If you're over worrying, stop it. You you have to reside in the Lord. Practice self-control. And if you don't have it, like I, I fall in these areas myself all the time, so I'm preaching myself, pray about it. And this is something that is part of your sanctification if this isn't being addressed in your life it's not a surprise that bigger things haven't come up in your life because this has to be addressed first right it's foundational mm-hmm. all right we will leave it there and go on to pinion this is the second category so we just did all the routine stuff stuff you probably hear in church a lot here's the pinion things this is where i think things get interesting and again pinion is that that joint so you've got all the gears moving the bicep with this robot arm this is the joint the elbow that's actually moving these are things that come up you make one big decision and it affects a big chunk of your life and this is where people usually pray right first category i think of is work where you work choosing your first job um choosing your future jobs, right? Should I jump off this job? Should I be here five years and move to a different job? Where do I want to be working? What field do I want to be working in? How do I want to be working? Do I want to take somebody else's position? All that. What is the attitude we should have towards our work, Sebastian? A great question. Let's start easy. Let's start really easy. As long as you're not doing committing blasphemy in your work or you're not doing something that will be sinful, you can continue with that work. Let's just get that, let's just get that off. Because, you know, there's some works that do require you to do sinful things so you're saying don't jump off just because you're working garbage disposal right now yes because pray about it and ask if this is the best way that you could be serving the serving the lord for that for attitude for work it is very important to remember that we are working not only for a human supervisor but also for the lord who sees and supervises all things that are happening on this earth Straight from Colossians 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Which is uh, something I remind myself of every day, because talk about something that seems very mundane. If you're going to school, it seems very mundane. If you're going to work, there there's exciting days, there's stressful days, but for the most part, it seems very mundane. Uh, especially if you're not doing something that seems super godly, right? I work at a marketing firm. And you work at a customer service and sales customer service place, right? So these aren't things that seem like, oh, I am changing the world, me, myself, and my CEO. But work as if you work for the Lord regardless. I mean, the people that he's writing to in Colossians were um, not doing anything that was particularly important either in the grand yeah. scheme of things. They had stuff from farmers, mm-hmm. herders, or like the 
potters, you know, for people that work with clay. There were sometimes rich people, but yes, you had all the spectrum, and he's addressing all these people. Mm-hmm. And they're slaves. I mean, they're oh yes, lower people than us, right? And that those works if you work for the Lord. Yes, and very important too with work. I think the book of Proverbs is a good place to go to if you would like some general idea of how to address certain issues. For example, on the topic of work, here it says from Proverbs 6, Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. Here's Proverbs 10 now. A wise youth harvests in the summer, but one who sleeps during harvest is a disgrace. Well, you know, there's some, well, the metaphors here might be, you know, a little bit old fashioned, you know, because back then it was agricultural societies. I think you can still get the point from this, that when you're at work, give it your best. Mm -hmm. From Colossians, you are serving the Lord. So, I mean, while we're humans, we can do screw up. Don't make a fool of yourself at work. Give it your best. Do not be lazy because work is edifying. It builds character. And as I said before, you're serving the Lord. Yeah. And, and what are we? We're harvesting every day, right? It's an eight, eight hour harvest every day. And we get weekends off. I mean, that's fantastic. <laughs> I, I've heard studies that sometimes say that agricultural societies worked a lot less in general. They had mm-hmm. big seasons of work and then, then a lot of rest and other projects that they do. And that's probably true. In this modern age, we do a lot of continuous work because the right. heart is not harvesting anymore right you can work all the time and therefore there's benefit to you working all the time but we also get eight hour days right we never have a harvest day really i mean there i guess there are certain days that something goes crazy and you might be working a 60 hour week or something but that's not usually sustained and if it is mm-hmm. you're probably choosing to do that which is you might need to examine if it's worth you know mm-hmm. 60 hour weeks and honest work is actually praised by the Lord. From mm-hmm. Proverbs 21, we get that good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Are these all set in stone? You know, God will condemn you. No, like, will this happen? Will all these things in Proverbs happen all the time? No, but they are general guidelines on how to approach different issues. So being a garbage man, working on the phone as customer service, it is, you know, constant work. It is humble. But nonetheless, it is good. It is good work. It's as I said, builds character, and you're serving the Lord. Yeah, and that's why I think we as men get uh, anybody, not just men, but me and Sebastian as men, we get a little obsessed, or can be tempted to be obsessed with our position, and you know, are we going to make a name for ourselves? And I'm not even a particularly ambitious guy, and I think I have those thoughts, right? Oh, is this work even? Where is it going to get me in? five years and again i'm not a particularly ambitious guy i went to business school where there's people that way out ambition being good on them but i find myself thinking those same thoughts so you have to be careful that you don't become dissatisfied with your work and in it start doing a bad job and start not working easy to work for the lord because you're waiting to be the ceo you know you're waiting to have your own million dollar idea so that you can sit in a beach in coba and not care about it right but that's not the way the bible tells us to work even if you did make a million dollars on some brilliant idea you still have to work as if you work for the Lord. If you don't work, you've got nothing. Exactly. All right. That's opinion decision where you work. And basically we're saying wherever you work, work for the Lord. It shouldn't be a big deal. But work. I think an important discussion here is also work. If you aren't working, work. Right? If you have to move to work, move. Because a, a person that's not working is somebody who's not contributing. Right? You, Any talents you've given, you've been given, you're not using them by definition right if you're if you're a stay-at-home mom and there's a big period of your day where you're not doing anything all your kids are at, at school find something to do because it's sitting on your butt it's an old puritan saying but idle hands are the devil's work shop you'll mm-hmm. end up doing something evil work so that you can be edified again biblical command second opinion thing that i think comes up a lot budgeting this is a, a bit of a tithing thing right so if you don't know what a tithe is a tithe is a tenth means just a tenth and there's a biblical principle that i would i would suggest that you should give 10 percent of your income to the lord so working you get income you should give 10 percent of it to the lord the principle is that the levites um, were given 10 percent of the produce of the land so we give 10 percent to the lord that's not a hard and fast number you could give more you can give less however i think that it's a general guideline 
that if you can give 10%, and by can, I really mean if you can, Mm -hmm. not if you want to, or if it's comfortable, if you can, I think you should give 10%. And this, it's not just a tithing discussion, but I think that's important for creating your budget Mm -hmm. because of the many talents God gives you, he gives you your health and your, your actual skills, but he also gives you wealth. Like me and you, Sebastian, and most of our listeners live in the United States, and we are the wealthiest country on earth by far, probably that has ever existed as far as comparisons go. Mm-hmm. And we have tons of wealth. So even the poorest in the United States has tons of wealth, meaning we should put it to good use because this is a huge talent the Lord has provided this nation. We need to manage it properly. My basic tips, not to be a money podcast here, but my basic tips are don't spend more than you make. Right, One, right. Two, know where all your money's going. Three, give to the Lord. That that would be my three basic tips. You can go into details about budgeting, and I would love to. I'm a big budgeting guy. My mom instilled in me a great budgeting methods, uh, accrual budgeting, and a bunch of other stuff. But my three tips would be: don't spend more than you make. So don't get into debt. That's an obvious and it's easier said than done. But don't that that is a command. Don't do it. Secondly. Know where your money's going. Know where every single one of your dollars is going. Is it going towards saving for food? Is it going towards saving for retirement? Is it going towards the Lord? Because if you don't know how much you have, not only can you not control your money, you also can't even be grateful about it. When the Lord gives you $30,000 and you don't really notice it, then you can't really be grateful about it, right? But if you know where all the money's going, you can be. And by knowing where you're, where it's going, you're not just wasting it. You're you, mm-hmm. Everything has a purpose. Yep. And by having it a, giving it a purpose, I would say that it's good character building. Because you're not just to the other extreme of wasting it and, you know, spending more than you make. You can just hoard it and Mm -hmm. do... And equally, it's essentially wasted, right? Uh Uh-huh. Exactly. And I was... uh, There's actually a lot of proverbs on hoarding money, which is an easy... It's an easy trap that we can fall to if we're not careful. So, from Proverbs 1, right off the bat, it says, Such is the fate of all who are greedy for money. It robs them of life. Proverbs 21 says, those who love pleasure become poor. Those who love wine and luxury will never be rich. And also from Proverbs 10, the earnings of the godly enhance their lives, but evil people squander their money on sin. Just what we're talking about. Are you overspending your money? Is it actually edifying? If you're overspending it, likely that you're probably using it on things just for, for fun. But are you using your talents and your wealth responsibly, giving it to your church? donating it to some missionary work does it has to, it could also be outside of your outside of your church things that are edifying for the kingdom wouldn't you say mm-hmm. and that's uh, jesus himself so not just proverbs jesus himself talks about parable of the man who reaps a great harvest bigger than he ever encountered right mm-hmm. and instead of using the wheat to buy things either for himself in exchange and therefore people are getting wheat like these people are benefiting from him exchanging mm-hmm. the wheat course he's benefiting so in your mind you're thinking oh it's really selfish to sell all your wheat because you're making a profit but everybody that's buying it is making a a benefit too because they wanted the wheat instead of doing that he builds a huge barn so that he can store it all because he's just he wants to sit on it Mm -hmm. why i mean not because he was worried about next year just because he wants to sit on it i'm sure because he's wanting an easier life you know he wants to like ride it out and never have to harvest again and the oh man i'm gonna forget the end the barn burns down i think and all that's destroyed could blow down and all destroyed somehow the barn burns down and all the extra grain is destroyed too and now the man is left with nothing because he decided to try to hoard it all and that's a warning hey if you're hoarding for the sake of hoarding or even hoarding for the sake of a carefree life don't do it that doesn't mean don't save for retirement it doesn't mean don't save things for yourself and it doesn't mean don't ever buy wine for things that are nice right but it does mean check your heart right? yes yes it's what your intentions are going to are you going are you is your priority build the kingdom for the Lord or is it to have fun in life? You see, you see us, you know, mm-hmm. that's the difference. You can enjoy wine and praise the Lord, but are you, you, see, you know what I mean? You're, there's a difference between using creation and be thankful to the Lord with it versus going and just like having fun for the sake of pleasuring yourself. Yeah. And if that's a problem area for you and you feel like that could be a problem area, pray about it. Because mm-hmm. I think that's something that if you pray about it, God's going to reveal it to you and show you where your heart is. Because that's something that he warns against a lot. So if you're doing it, you'd think you'd be convicted about it. Mm-hmm. Proverbs 11 says, Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. There you go. All right. Another opinion category, where you live. This goes along with wealth, so I'll be brief. But 
where you live should be a lot like where you work. It should just be the place where you live. Now, do you want to edify people in your work? Yes. So should you edify people with where you live? That is building a, a nice space, making sure you upkeep your yard if you have a yard or just your apart. I live in an apartment building, so I don't have a yard to be upkeeping, but I do keep up my apartment and make sure that I'm, I'm keeping up good appearances and not bothering anybody. Also cleaning my apartment, thinking about economically, is this still a good buy? Am I wasting money? Should I be investing in a house that builds equity? These are things that are moderately important. But I say the most important part about where you live is that one, you're in a place that you have a church. Two, that the place is budgeted appropriately for your budget, right? That you're not overspending. And then three, that it's a place you're upkeeping in discipline, right? Are you letting everything go to crap? You know, it's like there, there are holes forming in the walls because you haven't been, I don't know, cleaning the gutters and now your house is going to fall over and it's just because of neglect. Don't do that. Animals running around. Animals running around. You need to have rats. You should deal with that, right? You could get a cactus, Michael. I just thought about that. You don't have a, a yard? No, I don't have cactus. any pets either. <laughs> I've got a, I got a courtyard in my, my apartment building. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but all that's to say, you can get kind of obsessed about house hunting. You'll definitely know people in your life that are obsessed about house hunting and they always want to live in a different place. Don't be, because it's just the place you live. Just the earth. All right, another thing that's opinion moment. Wife, husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, but I'm going to be more serious and say the wife because that's the ultimate end goal. I'm going to say something that might be kind of controversial, but it's getting less and less controversial these days because I think we've hit a peak of controversy on it. Get a wife if you are a man and get a husband if you're a woman. That's the generic That's the generic thing, and you should expect it. Does that mean that you should be slobbering around trying to find like the first person that ever winks at you? No, <laughs> no, but pray about it and it and expect that you will marry i do not think and i think we're often when we don't get a, a wife the first time or husband if you're a, a, a woman the first time you know or like it's you're 22 and you haven't been dating anybody seriously like myself you're like oh well maybe i'm just one of the woe is me my you know hand of the forehead woe is me i am one of the few that god is destined for solitary living and like one of the eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom as jesus would say while there are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom, that is people that don't get married for the sake of spreading the gospel, that is not the norm. The vast majority of people get married and you do not want to shirk getting married because you're afraid of the responsibility that it'll bring. Because it will, it does bring responsibility and it is hard, it builds character, but it also brings, it edifies you, it edifies your partner, it edifies the children you make and it edifies the community as a whole because you grow as a person, right? So it is the norm. Expect it, pray about it, and don't shirk it because you're afraid of responsibility. Those are the things I'd have to say. Do you have comments on that? The only thing would be that what if someone says that starts quoting Paul, even though it's just his suggestion, mm -hmm. saying that you know, for those that are single, it's best for you to stay to stay single because you're gonna get distracted with all these things that your wife or your husband's gonna do, rather than the person that is single. You can focus 100% on the lord yeah and jesus says there are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom there's eunuchs by the hand of man and then there's eunuchs from birth these are all legitimate categories of people and jesus says mm -hmm. for those that can accept this teaching you accept it so i think that you should and we should never we want to be balanced on this right we should never think that you are sinning because you aren't married mm -hmm. because there are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom i think that paul is expressing the opinion that he's a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom and it's pretty great because he's living in God's will. If you look at the stats, I think that it, had we all been eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom or even 50% of Christians be eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom, things wouldn't have worked out the way they have in a good way. As in, they wouldn't have worked out in a good way the way they have. God clearly isn't calling everyone to be a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom. So if you are, you'll know it because you don't desire to get married. Right. Mm -hmm. If you don't desire to get married and it's not a shirking of responsibility, then yeah, you might be that category. If you desire to get married, I don't think you're fitting that category. Why would you have that desire if God was going to make you a eunuch anyways? It, mm -hmm. it, it's possible, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, and I preached myself to don't play the what was me card just because you aren't married right now at this very moment. Right. And can you tell what tomorrow is going to be like? No. Can you tell what 20 years from now is going to be like? No. So who are you to say that the Lord is 
waiting for the right moment for you to get married. So I would say there's there's that. Like, don't despair Yeah, if you're single. And what about the person that you should marry? The, t- the belief that the, that those people... Oh, yes. Well, th- okay. This is going to open up a can of worms as far as, like, all, all the things you might want to consider about uh-huh. a, a wife or a husband, whoever you are. I mean, smash wife. But, uh, yes, <laughs> Maria, don't hit yourself to an unbeliever. And like I said, getting uh, focusing on getting a wife, getting a husband, and being responsible in that way should not be me picking up the first person that likes me because that can end a disaster. And the scripture does say, do not hit yourself. Do not hit yourself like an ox hit to another ox to an unbeliever because you'll both be pulling to different sides. Don't do it. It will mm-hmm. not be a great marriage. Now, there's things to talk about. You know, what if I've already had sex with this person? There's lots of different categories to talk about there. And that's why it's kind of a podcast in and of itself. But this isn't a get married quick <laughs> thing that I'm telling you. It's just, you know, don't don't be shirking responsibility and mm-hmm. not getting married. Well said. And me and Sebastian aren't married, so <laughs> I take that with a grain of salt. Uh-huh. Okay. Next one on the opinion list. This one's a total opinion from Michael. Get a weapon. If you're a man, I think you should have a weapon. And that's not because you want to commit violence. That's because you want to protect. I think that this is a opinion moment because it changes your attitude towards weapons. I think when we I'm speaking from from my own experience here, but Sebastian, I think too, when we're young, we're into video games and you like the weapons there and me and Sebastian are history buffs. So we like thinking about the armor and the weapons that ancient Romans used and other peoples. And it's fun to imagine yourself being a warrior soldier. Um, I can't speak to women, um, but <laughs> that's as a man, that's cool, right? And it, Some Scythian tribe, uh, tribes some women. Some Scythian tribe, oh, what a curved sword. No, I'm saying that the women. The Syrians, oh, yes. you know. Okay, yes. Women have to fight sometimes, but not not in the major. I think that it's a, a moment of adulthood versus kidhood to go from idolizing soldierhood and weaponry to actually getting one, not for the sake of showing off to your friends and not for the sake of like whipping it around and showing it on social media, but for the sake of being a protective tool, a life-saving implement that you would use in a very, very serious manner if you ever needed to. That's... It changes your whole opinion on on violence, I think, if you're doing it responsibly. It changes your opinion on use of force um, because you actually have to think about, first of all, the consequences of using force, and then when would you ever do it? So you, it suddenly it sobers you up to from a childlike love of weaponry and, and fighting in general to a serious adulthood protective style that will come in use when you need to do it. Like If you need to protect your family, if you need to protect the state, you want to have a weapon. So, and by weapon, I mean a gun <laughs> in the modern age. Because you get a, a sword. You get a sword. It's not going to help you too much. Uh, Jesus says to his, his disciples, carry a sword when they're going out for the, his final uh, mission when he leaves. Carry a sword because for, for protection. He's not saying go conquer, right? That's not his his final call is conquer with the sword. It, it's carry a sword in protection because you'll need to protect yourself, others. That's what it's there for. So, I would, for any man, and Women too, if you're alone, though, I think there's mixed opinions about it. Get a weapon, not for the sake of being violent and not for the sake of showing off to your friends and not for the sake of wasting money either. There's plenty of cheap guns out there. But in the U.S., you can get a weapon. I Get a weapon. I have no real opinion because you know, growing up in Peru, it's not really... The, the mentality is different. I think in my entire life, I've only seen one gun store in all of in all of Peru, so... It's probably more, but I'm just still, I'm just Welcome using to this. U.S. baby. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's just the mentality. Am I against it? No, because I think that yes, yeah, you said, you are you can defend yourself in emerge in extreme emergency situations, whereas if you don't, you can't, and then a tragedy might happen if you can't defend yourself. So mm-hmm. I see, I do see the value. I just don't have, I don't have a personal opinion. So, if you're not gonna do obscenities with it if you're going to be responsible yeah if, you, if you're tempted of doing obscenities yeah <laughs> maybe rethink <laughs> those thoughts and pray about that before you grab the weapon i for me i didn't have those thoughts one two i was more childlike about that whole category of things until i got a weapon once i got a weapon i've been much more sober about it mm-hmm. so yeah i would say if it if it gives you character then and it's something that you see yourself handling with care by all means go ahead all right, last last opinion topic, serve the body. Again, serve the church body, that is. This can be a, a routine thing. Like if you're serving in the parking lot, you're serving with the kids. It can also be a opinion thing. 
how to, if God is calling you to vocational ministry, for instance, you're going to make it your vocation. Well, then of course it's opinion thing. It has to do with your work. It, even, even if it's just a serious involvement in the church, say you're going to be an elder, not a, not a paid elder, not a vocational, but, but an elder, that's a serious opinion. If it, you should be serious about always asking God if that's where he's calling you, especially as you get older. So maybe in our youth, we're still learning a lot from our uh, people above us and we're kind of learning, getting our footing in the church and, and starting with the small things, but continues to be praying about serious commitments that you could be making for the church. Mm -hmm. And in scripture, there is high expectations for people in, in leadership. Mm -hmm. They have to be of impeccable character. I mean, sure, we're all humans, we are flawed, yes, but you have to be less sinful than the Joe next to you, than the Joe next to you in the congregation. It's really high expectations. So yes, pray about it, think it through, and if you are con if you are certain that the Spirit is leading you, converse with your church, and then you know get to that position. All right. Do you have any other opinion ones, Sebastian? Or opinion ones? No, I think we touched on very important ones. So we've got routine stuff. Went through it. That's the typical stuff you hear. Opinion ones, these are things you usually hear on non-Christian podcasts, but I, they apply to everyone. So, in fact, let me shout out. There's a great podcast called How to Build Your Tent. It's on the Light, Fight, Laugh, Feast Network, and it's all about business things that you'd hear on a normal like business economic podcast, except from a Christian talking from a Christian perspective. Great podcast if you're into money-making work kind of thing. If you want to balance that with a Christian perspective, it's a great one. These are things that I think we should all be thinking about. We all live in the real world, and we should be working as if we work for Christ. So don't don't make it a secular world as in you don't involve Christ in your work, marriage, living space, whether or not you buy a gun. <laughs> Give it all to God. <laughs> Give it all to God. <laughs> Last category of things, and this is going to be brief, attitudinal. What should your attitude be? Is that even a category? Yes, it definitely is. How you shape your attitude is a choice. Of course, your emotions can sometimes get the better of you, so pray about it. God is the controller. He gives the fruit of self-control, gives the fruit of joy, all these fruits in the spirit. Here's four attitudes I think that we should all have. First of all, Christ's kingdom calls you to be ready to die at any moment. And I mean that physically, and I mean that spiritually and emotionally, be ready to die. So if you think that you want to prolong your life, be prepared that if somebody were to come around and saying, if you're a Christian, I'm going to shoot your head. Be prepared to say, yeah, I'm still a Christian. Right? Don't, don't give up. That's when you pull up the good old Philippians to live is Christ and, and to die is gain. gain. Exactly. And it, and it doesn't just have to be that, right? I mean, when are we going to be in a scenario where they're threatening to kill us? Most likely not unless things change. However, they might threaten to fire you or never promote you, right? Be ready to die. That might not be your case right now and it might never be your case, but be ready to die. Don't make it a blocking point where you're like, well, God, <laughs> I'm with you now. <laughs> but if it ever came down between my promotion and you, I would have to drop it no be ready to die you have to mentally prepare before it happens because mm -hmm. you don't want to be stuck in a terrible spot second attitude be willing to give everything to god and that's not just to be willing it means i think we are often it's almost easier if something really big is happening in our life to turn to god because it's really big and we know he's watching right like if your grandma is dying or that's <laughs> yeah, that's not that big of a thing if you're whole family died in a plane crash. You'd be like, ah, God, and you fall to your knees and you, this is a huge event, which is something yeah. you should give to God, right? If that's happening, you should give it to God. If you are being encouraged to move someplace, you know, that's something that seems big, you give it to God. However, don't just give big things to God. God absolutely needs the big things. But every tiny minutia, he brought, you know, he, he made all the minutia, right? He made the details on some deep sea water creatures we'll never see. He knows the details of your life. He sees it. He's seeing it with you. If you are hungry and you're like, oh, where should I eat? Maybe you should pray about it to God. He, he cares. If you are worried about a presentation at work, pray about it to God. Give it to God because he controls everything. If you're worried about getting to work or getting to home on time, pray about it to God. If you're worried about having bad dreams, Pray about it to God. Like these are things that seem like God wouldn't care, like you're bothering him, but he sees them anyways. He's not bothered. And it shows, first of all, it shows great faith that you're giving it to him. But secondly, he answers. He's a kind father. I can speak glowingly that every day I give stuff at my work to God and absolutely he answers. And I, you could really only describe it when you're a Christian and you've seen this happen before, but God delivers. He actually does it. It's like, Magic, except it's not magic. It's from the Lord. 
that, that's not a prosperity gospel thing. I'm not saying that I make millions of dollars now because I, you know, ask for a Ferrari and it pops up or I say, oh God, make this presentation good. And it always is the best thing ever, it's, but give it to God. That's important, Michael. What are you asking for? Are you asking to please yourself or asking for holy things that will edify you, sanctify you, and also serve the Lord better? Yeah, I mean, I think that you, yes, first of all, ask things right. that aren't crazy right if you're asking for sinful things then he's not gonna answer like you. a bugatti right like a bugatti but i think we can with that same attitude thinking oh is this edifying is this holy we can also tend to think that everyday things aren't edifying and aren't holy like what should i have for breakfast oh i should make it to work on time oh i hope this presentation goes well oh i'm so stressed right now those things don't seem to me like a big deal in the grand scheme of things, they don't seem like they'd even be on the radar of things that are edifying and building up the kingdom, but they are. They're in your life for a reason. Give it to God. Mm -hmm. Well said. All right. Third attitude. Be quick to repent. That's self-explanatory. If you are going against the Lord and you know it, God convicts you with his Holy Spirit. Be quick to repent. And this is preached to all of us, right? Mm -hmm. If you know you are in sin, don't hide from God and don't dwell on the sin because you're afraid of facing God. Be quick to repent. If you were watching your own TV show, you know, on those pretty B movies where the main character has been caught up in a lie, right? They like lied about their age or something to their boyfriend. And now everything's unraveling because he figured out that she was younger than she said she was. And then also she's not from Canada. And like, he's mm -hmm. like, oh, you lied to me. And she leaves. And, and she's like, should she wallow in that and never like go up and apologize to him and just hide? No. And and when they prolong it in this stupid movie, you're like, oh my gosh, I know how this ends. You know, it's going to be another 20 minutes of this. Please just resolve it quickly. Same thing in your life, except it's not 20 minutes. It's like a week, a year. Do not let that happen. Be quick to repent. And it's worse usually than lying to your boyfriend about being from Canada. It's you have a drug problem. Be quick to repent. And repent means not only confess the sin to the Lord, but agree with him that it's bad and turn from it. I can't speak from experience with this. At Not at my current work, but back a year ago, something that I felt, you know, the conviction of sin and I drew repentance when you just said this was that I remember just trash talking someone at work. And then when I got home at night, like, you know, it was, my day was normal, I had a great day. And then I got, I laid down and I started praying. And then I realized, like, my goodness, what have I done? This is terrible. And I actually, it made me really sad. And I, and I just confessed, every, and I confessed everything to the Lord. So that's an example of what would be something sinful that convicts you. It could be something, you know, as big as drugs, or it could be something that you have done during the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be quick to repent. Don't, don't stay in it. And then lastly, my last one is be content with God alone. And with everything that you get, you know, you can praise the Lord. Thank you, God, for this job. Thank you, God, for this podcast. Thank you, God, for the money you give. Thank you, God, for this food before me. But with everything, like Jesus says, may God's will be done, right? If he were to take that job, that money, that food in front of you, that lady, that your health, um, the, where, where you live, every good gift that you can celebrate and praise God for, be willing and say, God, if you were to take it all, I am content with you and you alone. Please strip me of being attached to things overly, right? If God were to break it all away for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the story, whatever it might be, don't be one who's angry with God because of that. Are you hinting at Job here, I am. Michael? Yes, oh, yes, I have it ready. Yes, Job 1, naked. I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that is, if you if you want to know that attitude, read Job. I got everything taken from him. And he, and he ends up getting double back, triple back. Mm -hmm. So don't think that it means that you'll never get anything back, and that it's not good to enjoy things of life, but don't enjoy them so much that you would curse God if you took them away. That it blinds you from mm -hmm. what really matters. Well, Sebastian, those are our three categories. Hopefully it gives people an idea where we are as young adults and helps steer people in discipline, in truth, and how we should approach the little that we've been given so far so that we can be given a lot in later in life. Any closing thoughts? We covered so much, and I really say it comes down to attitude. You know, If you feel 
tense after listening to this or after hearing preaching from your church. I think the fact that you are a little bit, you know, worried about like what have I been doing? It's a good sign. It's a good start, like stepping stone. And now you just have to see: Am I evalu do an evaluation? Am I praying? Am I reading scripture? Baby steps, I would say. It's all babies. It's all baby steps, and that's part of the, your life as a believer. You're never gonna reach uh, perfection until until we die. Mm -hmm. It's part of a process, sanctification. So give it your attitude, pray to the Lord. And I am confident that the Lord will deliver accordingly as he has planned in your life. Yep. Don't despise small beginnings. So if you aren't doing these things and you only start with one per week or something like that, don't despise small beginnings. However, I'm definitely the kind of guy myself that if I'm going to give in to the premise that I should be doing these things, let me just go a whole hog and do it all at once. So <laughs> I would encourage you just to do it all at once. Like they're all good. So do it. Mm -hmm. But I understand that that's much easier said than done. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I've been, oh, we've been the found cause. We found our cause in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been Michael, the man behind the machine. And to my right across the table from me is Sebastian, the bookkeeper. Thanks for listening. Again, leave us a like and subscribe on our YouTube channel or find us on Facebook and like up. Find us on podbean.com and everything like that. And maybe one day we'll be on regular podbean places or regular podcast places. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye. Goodbye.